Welcome. This is Signal. The Kit Bag by Algernon Blackwood From Paul Mall Magazine December 1908 When the words not guilty sounded through the crowded courtroom that dark December afternoon, Arthur Wilbraham, the great criminal K.C., and leader of the triumphant defense, was represented by his junior, but Johnson, his private secretary, carried the verdict across to his chambers like lightning. "'It's what we expected, I think,' said the barrister, without emotion. "'And personally, I'm glad the case is over.' There was no particular sign of pleasure that his defense of John Turk, the murderer, on a plea of insanity, had been successful, for no doubt he felt, as everybody who watched the case felt, that no man had better deserved the gallows. I'm glad to, said Johnson. She had sat in the court for ten days, watching the face of the man who had carried out with callous detail one of the most brutal and cold-blooded murders in recent years. The counsel glanced up at his secretary. They were more than employer and employed. For family and other reasons, they were friends. Ah, I remember, yes, he said with a kind smile. You want to get away for Christmas. You're going to skate and ski the Alps, aren't you? If I was your age, I'd come with you. Johnson laughed shortly. She was a young woman of 26 with a delicate face like a girl's. I can catch the morning boat now, she said. But that's not the reason I'm glad the trial is over. I'm glad it's over because I've seen the last of that man's dreadful face. It positively haunted me. That white skin with the black hair brushed low over the forehead is a thing I shall never forget. And the description of the way the dismembered body was crammed and packed with lime into that... Don't dwell on it, my dear interrupted the other, looking at her curiously out of his keen eyes. Don't think about it. Such pictures have a trick of coming back when one least wants them. He paused a moment. Go on, he added presently. Enjoy your holiday. I shall want all your energy for my parliamentary work when you get back. And don't break your neck skiing. Johnson shook hands and took her leave. At the door, she turned suddenly. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you, she said. Would you mind lending me one of your kit bags? It's too late to get one, and I leave in the morning before the shops are open. Of course. I'll send Henry over with it to your rooms. You shall have it the moment you get home. I promise to take great care of it, said Johnson gratefully. Delighted to think that within thirty hours she would be nearing the brilliant sunshine of the high Alps in winter. The thought of that criminal court was like an evil dream in her mind. She dined at her club and went to the Bloomsbury, where she occupied the top floor of one of the old, gaunt houses in which the rooms were large and lofty. The floor below her own was vacant and unfurnished, and below that were lodgers for whom she did not know. It was cheerless, and she looked forward heartily to a change. The night was even more cheerless. It was miserable, and few people were about. A cold, sleety rain was driving down the streets before the keenest east wind she had ever felt. It howled dismally among the big, gloomy houses of the great squares, and when she reached her rooms, she heard it whistling and shouting over the world of black roofs beyond her windows. In the hall, she met her landlady, shading a candle from the drafts with her thin hand. This come by a man from Mr. Wilburn's, ma'am. She pointed to what was evidently the kit bag, and Johnson thanked her and took it upstairs with her. I shall be going abroad in the morning for ten days, Miss Monks, she said. I'll leave an address for letters. And I hope you'll have a Merry Christmas, ma'am, she said in a raucous, wheezy voice that suggested spirits, and better weather than this. Oh, I hope so, too, replied her lodger, shuddering a little as the wind went roaring down the street outside. 
When she got upstairs, she heard the sleet lolling against the window panes. She put her kettle on to make a cup of hot coffee and set about putting a few things in order for her absence. And now I must pack, such as my packing is. She laughed to herself and set to work at once. She liked the packing, for it brought the snow mountains so vividly before her and made her forget the unpleasant scenes of the past ten days. Besides, it was not elaborate in nature. Her friend had lent her the very thing, a stout canvas kit bag, sack-shaped, with holes around the neck for a brass bar and padlock. It was a bit shapeless, true, and not much to look at, but its capacity was unlimited, and there was no need to pack carefully. She shoved in her waterproof coat, her fur cap and gloves, her skates and climbing boots, her sweaters, snow boots, and ear caps, and then on top of all these she piled her woolen shirts and underwear, her thick socks, hoodies, and knickerbockers. The dress suit came next, in case the hotel people dressed for dinner, and then, thinking the best way to pack her white shirt, she paused for a moment to reflect. That's the worst of these kit bags, she mused vaguely, standing in the center of the sitting room where she had come to fetch some string. It was after ten o'clock. A furious gust of wind rattled the windows as though to hurry her up, and she thought with pity of the poor Londoners whose Christmas would be spent in such a climate, whilst she was skimming the snowy slopes in bright sunshine and dancing in the evening with rosy-cheeked girls. Ah! That reminded her. She must put in her dancing pumps and evening socks. She crossed over from her sitting room to the cupboard on the landing where she kept her linen. And as she did so, she heard someone coming softly up the stairs. She stood still for a moment on the landing to listen. Ah, it was Miss Monk's step, she thought. She must be coming up with the last of the post. But then the step ceased suddenly, and she heard no more. They were at least two flights down and she came to the conclusion that they were far too heavy to be those of her bibulous landlady. No doubt they belonged to a late lodger who had mistaken his floor. She went into her bedroom and packed her pumps and dress shirts as best she could. The kit bag by this time was two-thirds full, and stood upright on its own base like a sack of flour. For the first time she noticed that it was old and dirty, and the canvas faded and worn. It had obviously been subjected to rather rough treatment. It was not a very nice bag to have sent her, certainly not a new one, or one that her chief valued. She gave the matter a passing thought and went on with her packing. Once or twice, however, she caught herself wondering who it could have been wandering down below, for Miss Monks had not come up with letters, and the floor was empty and unfurnished. From time to time, moreover, she was almost certain she heard the soft tread of someone padding over bare boards, cautiously, stealthily, as silently as possible, and further, that the sounds had been lately coming distinctly nearer. For the first time in her life, she began to feel a little creepy. Then. As though to emphasize this feeling, an odd thing happened. As she left the bedroom, having just packed her recalcitrant white shirts, she noticed that the top of the kit bag lopped over towards her with an extraordinary resemblance to a human face. The canvas fell into a fold like a nose and forehead, and the brass rings for the padlock just filled the position of the eyes. A shadow... Or was it a travel stain, for she could not exactly tell, looked like hair? It gave her rather a turn, for it was so absurdly, so outrageously the face of John Turk the murderer. She laughed, and went into the front room where the light was stronger. That horrid case has got on my mind, she thought. I shall be glad for the change of scene and air. 
In the sitting room, however, she was not pleased to hear again the stealthy tread upon the stairs and to realize it was much closer than before, as well as unmistakably real. And this time she got up and went out to see who could be creeping about on the upper staircase at so late an hour. But the sound ceased. There was no one visible on the stairs. She went to the floor below, not without trepidation, and turned on the electric light to make sure that no one was hiding in the empty rooms of the unoccupied suite. There was not a stick of furniture large enough to hide a dog. Then she called over the banisters to Miss Monks, but there was no answer, and her voice echoed down the dark vault of the house, and was lost in the roar of the gale that howled outside. Everyone was in bed and asleep, except for herself and the owner of this soft, stealthy tread. My absurd imagination, I suppose, she thought. Must have been the wind after all, although it seemed so very real and close, I thought. She went back to her packing. It was by this time getting on towards midnight. She drank her coffee up and lit another cigarette, last before turning in. It is difficult to say exactly at what point fear begins, when the causes of that fear are not plainly before the eyes. Impressions gather on the surface of the mind, film by film, as ice gathers upon the surface of still water, but often so lightly that they claim no definite recognition from the consciousness. Then a point is reached where the accumulated impressions become a definite emotion and the mind realizes that something has happened. With something of a start, Johnson suddenly recognized that she felt nervous. Also, for some time past the causes of this feeling have been gathering slowly in her mind, but that she had just only reached the point where she was forced to acknowledge them. It was a singular and curious malaise that had come over her, and she hardly knew what to make of it. She felt as though she were doing something that was strongly objected to by another person. Another person, moreover, that had some right to object. It was the most disturbing and disagreeable feeling, and not unlike the persistent promptings of conscience. Almost, in fact, as though she were doing something she knew to be wrong. Yet, though she searched vigorously and honestly in her mind, she could nowhere lay her finger upon the secret of this growing uneasiness, and it perplexed her. More, it distressed and frightened her. Her nerves, I suppose, she said aloud with a forced laugh. Mountain air will cure all that. Ah, she added still speaking to herself, and that reminds me, my snow glasses. She was standing by the door of the bedroom during this brief soliloquy, and as she passed quickly towards the sitting room to fetch them from the cupboard, she saw out of the corner of her eye the indistinct outline of a figure standing on the stairs a few feet from the top. It was someone in a stooping position with one hand on the banisters and the face peering up towards the landing. At the same moment, she heard a shuffling footstep. The person who had been creeping below all this time at last had come up to her own floor. Who in the world could it be, and what in the name of heaven did he want? Johnson caught her breath sharply and stood stock still. Then after a few seconds' hesitation, she found her courage and turned to investigate. The stairs, she saw to her utter amazement, were empty. There was no one. She felt a series of cold shivers run over her, and something about the muscles in her legs began to give a little and grew weak. For the space of several minutes... She peered steadily into the shadows that congregated about the top of the staircase, 
where she had seen the figure. And then she walked fast, almost ran, in fact, into the light of the front room. But hardly had she passed inside the doorway when she heard someone come up the stairs behind her with a quick bound and go swiftly into her bedroom. It was a heavy, but at the same time stealthy footstep, the tread of someone who did not wish to be seen. And it was at this precise moment that the nervousness she had hitherto experienced leaped the boundary line and entered the state of fear. Almost of acute, unreasoning fear. Before it turned into terror, there was a further boundary to cross, and beyond that again lay the region of pure horror. Johnson's position was an unenviable one. By Jove, that was someone on the stairs then, she muttered, her flesh crawling all over. And whomever it was has gone into my bedroom. Her delicate pale face turned absolutely white, and for some minutes she hardly knew what to think or do. Then she realized intuitively that delay would only set a premium on fear, and she crossed the landing boldly and went straight into the other room, where, a few seconds before, the steps had disappeared. Who's there? Is that you, Miss Monks? She called aloud as she went and heard the first half of her words echo down the empty staircase, while the second half fell dead against the curtains in a room that apparently held no other human figure than her own. Who's there? She called again, in a voice unnecessarily loud, and that only just held firm. What do you want here? The curtain swayed very slightly, and as she saw it, her heart felt as if it almost missed a beat, yet she dashed forward and drew them aside in a rush. A window, streaming with rain, was all that met her gaze. She continued to search, but in vain. The cupboards held nothing but rows of clothes, hanging motionless, and under the bed there was no sign of anyone hiding. She stepped backwards into the middle of the room, and as she did so, something all but tripped her up. Turning with a sudden spring of alarm, she saw the kit bag. Odd, she thought, that's not where I left it. A few moments before, it had surely been on her right, between the bed and the bath. She did not remember having moved it. It was very curious. What in the world was the matter with everything? Were all her senses gone queer? A terrific gust of wind tore at the windows, dashing sleet against the glass with the force of a small gunshot, and fled away howling dismally over the waste of the Bloomsbury roofs. A sudden vision of the channel the next day rose in her mind and recalled her sharply to realities. There's no one here at any rate, that's quite clear, she exclaimed aloud. Yet at the time she uttered them, she knew perfectly well her words were not true, and she did not believe them herself. She felt exactly as though someone was hiding close about her, watching all her movements, trying to hinder her packing in some way. And my two senses, she added, keeping up the pretense, have played me the most absurd tricks. The steps I heard and the figure I saw were both entirely imaginary. She went back into the front room, poked the fire into a blaze, and sat down before it to think. What impressed her more than anything else was the fact that the kit bag was no longer where she had left it at. It had been dragged near the door. What happened afterwards that night happened, of course, to a woman already excited by fear and was perceived by a woman that had not the full and proper control, therefore, of the senses. Outwardly, Johnson remained calm and the master of herself to the end, pretending to the very last that everything she witnessed had a natural explanation or was merely delusions of her tired nerves. But inwardly, in her very heart, 
She knew all along that someone had been hiding downstairs in the empty suite when she came in, and that this person had watched his opportunity and then stealthily made his way to the bedroom. And all she saw and heard afterwards, from the moving of the kit bag to, well, the other things this story has to tell were caused directly by the presence of this invisible person. And it was here, just when she most desired to keep her mind and thoughts controlled, that the vivid pictures received day after day upon the mental plates exposed in the courtroom of the Old Bailey came strongly to light and developed themselves in the dark room of her inner vision. Unpleasant, haunting memories have a way of coming to life again, just when the mind least desires them, in the silent watches of the night, on sleepless pillows, during the lonely hours spent by sick and dying beds. And so now, in the same way, Johnson saw nothing but the dreadful face of John Turk the murderer, glowering at her from every corner of her mental field of vision. The white skin, the evil eyes, and the fringe of black hair low over the forehead. All the pictures of those ten days in court crowded back over into her mind unbidden and very vivid. This is all rubbish and nerves, she exclaimed at length, springing with sudden energy from her chair. I shall finish my packing and go to bed. I'm overwrought, overtired. No doubt at this rate I shall hear steps and things all night. But her face was deadly white all the same. She snatched up her field glasses and walked across to the bedroom, humming a music hall song as she went, a trifle too loud to be natural. And the instant she crossed the threshold and stood within the room, something turned cold about her heart, and she felt that every hair on her head stood up. The kit bag lay close in front of her, several feet nearer the door than she had left it, and just over its crumpled top she saw a head and face slowly sinking down out of sight, as though someone were crouching behind it to hide, and at the same moment a sound like a long-drawn sigh was distinctly audible in the still air about her between the gusts of the storm outside. Johnson had more courage and willpower than the girlish indecision of her face indicated, but at first, such a wave of terror came over her that for some seconds, she could do nothing but stand and stare. A violent trembling ran down her back and legs, and she was conscious of a foolish, almost a hysterical impulse to scream aloud. That sigh seemed in her very ear, and the air still quivered with it. It was an unmistakably human sigh. Who's there? She said at length, finding her voice, but though she meant to speak with loud decision, the tones came out instead in a faint whisper, for she had partly lost control of her tongue and lips. She stepped forward so she could see all around and over the kit bag. Of course there was nothing there, nothing but the faded carpet and the bulging canvas sides. She put out her hands and threw open the mouth of the sack where it had fallen over, being only three parts full and she saw for the first time, around the inside some six inches from the top, there ran a broad smear of dull crimson. It was an old and faded blood stain. She uttered a scream and drew back her hands as though they had been burnt. At the same time, the kit bag gave a faint but unmistakable lurch forward towards the door. Johnson collapsed backwards, searching with her hands for support of something solid, and the door, being further behind her than she realized, received her weight just in time to prevent her from falling, and shut with a resounding bang. At the same moment, the swinging of her left arm accidentally touched the electric switch, and the light in the room went out. It was an awkward and disagreeable predicament 
And if Johnson had been possessed of some real pluck, she might have done all manner of foolish things. As it was, however, she pulled herself together and groped furiously for the little brass knob to turn the light on again. But the rapid closing of the door had set the coats hanging on it a swinging, and her fingers became entangled in a confusion of sleeves and pockets, so that it was some moments before she found the switch. And in those few moments of bewilderment and terror, two things happened that sent her beyond recall over the boundary into the region of genuine horror. She distinctly heard the kit bag shuffling heavily across the floor in jerks, and close in front of her face sounded once again the sigh of a human being. In her anguished efforts to find the brass button on the wall, she nearly scraped the nails from her fingers, but even then, in those frenzied moments of alarm, so swift and alert were the impressions of a woman keyed up by a vivid emotion, she had time to realize that she dreaded the return of the light, and that it might be better for her to stay hidden in the merciful screen of darkness. It was but the impulse of a moment, however, and before she had time to act upon it, she had yielded automatically to the original desire, and the room was flooded again with light. But the second instinct had been right. It would have been better for her to have stayed in the shelter of the kind darkness. For there, close before her, bending over the half-packed kit bag, clear as life in the merciless glare of the electric light, stood the figure of John Turk, the murderer. Not three feet from her, the man stood, the fringe of black hair marked plainly against the pallor of the forehead, the whole horrible presentment of the scoundrel, as vivid as she had seen him day after day in the Old Bailey, when he had stood there in the dock, cynical and callous, under the very shadow of the gallows. In a flash, Johnson realized what it all meant. The dirty and much-used bag, the smear of crimson within the top, the dreadful stretch condition of the bulging sides. She remembered how the victim's body had been stuffed into a canvas bag for burial, ghastly dismembered fragments forced with lime into this very bag and the bag itself produced as evidence it all came back to her clear as day very softly and stealthily her hand groped behind her for the handle of the door but before she could actually turn it the very thing of all she most dreaded came about and John Turk lifted his devil's face and looked at her. At the same moment, that heavy sigh passed through the air of the room, formulated somehow into words. It's my bag, and I want it. Johnson just remembered clawing the door open and then falling in a heap upon the floor of the landing as she tried frantically to make her way into the front room. She remained unconscious for a long time, and it was still dark when she opened her eyes and realized that she was laying stiff and bruised on the cold boards. When the memory of what she had seen rushed back into her mind, she promptly fainted again. When she woke the second time, the wintry dawn was just beginning to peep in at the windows painting the stairs a cheerless, dismal gray, and she managed to crawl into the front room and cover herself with an overcoat in the armchair, where at length she fell asleep. A great clamor woke her, and she recognized Miss Monk's voice, loud and voluble. What? You ain't been to bed yet, ma'am. Are you ill? Or something happened? And there's an urgent gentleman to see you, though it ain't seven o'clock yet, and... Who is it? She stammered. I'm all right, thanks. Fell asleep in my chair, I suppose. Someone from Mr. Wilbraham's office. He says he ought to see you quick before you go abroad. I told him. Show him up, please, at once, said Johnson, whose head was whirling and her mind was still full of dreadful visions. Mr. Wilbraham's man came in with many apologies and explained briefly 
and quickly that an absurd mistake had been made and that the wrong kit bag had been sent over the night before. Henry somehow got a hold of the one that came over from the courtroom, and Mr. Wilbraham only discovered it when he saw his own lying in his room and asked why it had not gone to you, the man said. Oh, said Johnson stupidly. And he must have brought you the one from the murder case instead, ma'am, I'm afraid. The man continued without a ghost of an expression on his face. The one John Turk packed both the dead in. Mr. Wilbraham's awful upset about it, ma'am. Told me to come over here first thing this morning with the right one as you're leaving by the boat. He pointed to the clean-looking kit bag on the floor, which he had just brought. And I was to bring the other one back, ma'am, he added casually. For some minutes, Johnson could not find her voice. At last, she pointed in the direction of her bedroom. Perhaps you could kindly unpack it for me. Just empty the things out on the floor. The man disappeared into the other room and was gone for five minutes. Johnson heard the shifting to and fro of the bag and the rattle of skates and boots being unpacked. Thank you, ma'am, the man said, returning with the bag folded over his arm. Can I do anything more to help you, ma'am? What is it? asked Johnson, seeing that he still had something he wished to say. The man shuffled and looked mysterious. Begging your pardon, ma'am, but knowing your interest in the Turk case, I thought you'd like to know what's happened. Yes? John Turk killed himself last night immediately on getting his release. He left a note for Mr. Wilbraham saying he'd be much obliged if they put him away same as the woman he murdered in the old kit bag. What time did he do it? asked Johnson. Ten o'clock last night, ma'am, the warder says. The End